an energy shaping exoskeleton controller for human strength amplification. Some of the mobility impairments like sarcopenia and osteoarthritis can reduce a patient's available strength without entirely eliminating volitional control. This reduces quality of life by preventing activities of daily living, which are characterized by not quite periodic walking, stairs, chairs, car entry, etc. Lower extremity exoskeletons can help by augmenting a patient's strength. They can also be made back drivable so the user stays in control. By providing some fraction of the user's joint torque, they could reduce the required human effort, which is the side benefit of reducing the mechanical joint loads associated with osteoarthritis. But to control an exoskeleton to amplify strength is challenging because the exoskeleton must apply a fraction of human torque reliably enough to trust, even in never before seen tasks. The treadmill walking is a common lab test for exoskeletons. And perhaps due to the importance of treadmill experiments, many exoskeleton controllers today are tuned to work well in this environment. This has led to controllers that can take full advantage of periodicity in walking. However, outside the lab, these assumptions lead to restrictive exoskeleton behaviors that may need special control logic to handle, for example, stopping, or the transition from stairs to level ground. Energy shaping is a control method that lets you take the dynamics of a target human system that has an exoskeleton attached to it and reshape those dynamics to match a new target that you specify using Hamiltonian and Lagrangian mechanics. Our contribution today extends the energy shaping framework to allow for a novel strength amplification behavior. We consider a sagittal plane model of a human leg wearing an exoskeleton that kinematically begins from a constrained hip it continues down to the foot, a dangling leg model. Our target energy adds new states to this model that represent a second virtual leg, illustrated here in purple. It also adds a virtual spring connecting the virtual leg to the real one. The virtual leg has its own kinetic energy, and the virtual spring stores potential energy. While energy shaping is often used for autonomous systems, systems with inputs need to define more than just the target energy. They must define how the inputs will add or remove power from the system. Our model has three inputs, the human joint torques, the hip acceleration, and the ground reaction force, or GRF. We assume we can measure the constrained hip acceleration and the GRF, but not the human joint torques. Additionally, the joint accelerations, which would require differentiating encoders, are treated as unavailable. The existence of unknown inputs prevents us from exploiting algebraic substitutions based on the expression for joint acceleration. As part of our target system definition, we specify that the human torques and the inertial effects of the hip constraint affect both the real and virtual legs. The effect is in proportion to their masses, such that the two legs would accelerate together if acted on by only the human joint torques or if shaken from the hip. However, we leave the ground reaction force to act only on the real leg. We define our target Hamiltonian to combine four terms. The kinetic energy of the real leg, based on real leg mass matrix M sub 2, 2 and real leg momentum P sub 2. The potential energy of the virtual spring, based on virtual spring constant K sub V, real leg joint angles Q sub 2, and virtual joint angles Q sub V. The kinetic energy of the virtual leg, based on virtual leg mass matrix M sub V, and virtual leg momentum P sub V, and the gravitational potential energy of the real leg, G sub 2. The mass matrix for the virtual leg is defined as the quantity alpha minus 1 times the mass matrix for the real leg, with alpha a steady state amplification ratio greater than 1. Our control law defines the exoskeleton joint torques tau sub r transformed by the matrix S sub 2, which is related to our parameterization in terms of link rather than joint angles, as the sum of three terms, which are right to left, the torque from the virtual spring, a torque from a virtual damper that acts similarly to the virtual spring, and a special kinematic coupling term that results from our definition of the virtual leg mass matrix as a scaled version of the real leg mass matrix, this expression still depends on the dynamics of the virtual leg angles, which are explained in more detail in the paper. To summarize the entire controller behavior, we can draw an analogy using the frequency domain. The exoskeleton torque is a scaled and low-pass filtered version 
of the torque applied by the GRF in gravity, with some unusual Coriolis-like terms that again relate to our use of the real leg mass matrix to define the virtual leg's momentum and kinetic energy. The low-pass filter has a DC gain equal to the quantity alpha minus one over alpha. For example, if alpha is five, then the exoskeleton will be supporting four-fifths of gravity and resisting four-fifths of the GRF, with the human providing the additional fifth. Alpha thus reflects the ratio of the sum of human and exoskeleton effort to the effort of the human alone. We implemented the controller in a simple simulation environment to illustrate its behavior. We visualized the simulation using the stick figure you see here, with the pelvis, thigh, shank, and foot link. The ground reaction force is depicted with the green line as shown on the right. The simulations you see here compare an unamplified human on the left to an amplified human on the right. In both cases, the human behavior is modeled using simple spring damper joints and is acted on by a periodic of ground reaction force. The version on the right features an amplification factor of two, a special case where the human and exoskeleton share loads equally in steady state. The virtual stiffness and damping are chosen such that the system quickly reaches an equilibrium deflection between the real and virtual link angles. As a result, the amplified leg deflects much less in response to a GRF of equal magnitude than the unamplified leg. The above plot shows torques as a function of time for the simulation with amplification. The three line colors indicate three joints, hip in blue, knee in orange, and ankle in green. Human torques are shown as dotted lines and exoskeleton torques as solid lines. The human and exoskeleton torque lines are very similar. Since the, since the amplification ratio is two, this is exactly the intended behavior, equal human and exoskeleton torques. The leg is pushed three times for half a second, each time with half a second pause between pushes. When the push begins and when it ends, there are visible transients in the exoskeleton torque. The solid blue hip torque line shows these most clearly. These transients reflect the pre-equilibrium damped oscillation between the virtual mass and virtual spring. This behavior can be tuned by changing the virtual spring stiffness and virtual damping. A slower transient occurs in the dotted human torque lines, most notably in the blue hip and orange lines immediately after the pushes. In this time period, the system is oscillating about the human's target position, with the human and exoskeleton ultimately splitting the effort of compensating gravity. However, the exoskeleton does not appear to track this second transient. This is an important behavior, and to illustrate more clearly, we modify the damping coefficient for the knee in our simple human model to make the human transient less damped. This new version, shown on the right, clearly shakes for longer and with higher amplitude than before. Plotting the global shank angle as a function of time, we compare the original damped human simulation in blue with the new undamped knee simulation in red. The oscillation is clear. Returning to our torque plot, we compare the damped human on the left to the undamped knee on the right. In the dotted blue hip and orange knee lines on the right, the newly introduced oscillation is clear. The underdamped accelerations of the shank are made possible by these new oscillatory components of the hip and knee torque. And it is now even more clear that our energy shaping amplification controller is not amplifying this behavior of the humans. We could say that it pays attention to the GRF and gravity components of the human torque and ignores the work done by the human on the inertia of the system. In conclusion, the controller amplifies human ability to push against the ground and to support the mass of their own limbs. This would make it especially useful for a large class of activities of daily living that require assistance during stance, sitting and standing, crouching, and walking up stairs come to mind. But ignoring human-driven oscillation prevents it from assisting where faster motion is the problem. It wouldn't help you move your legs faster in the swing phase of walking or running. The controller is task invariant by design in the sense that this partial amplification of human torque is potentially helpful across many tasks and wouldn't be tuned on a per task basis. Thanks to the use of energy shape and control, the Hamiltonian can be used to prove passivity of the GRF foot motion port. However, since the human torque is applied to the virtual leg, the human exoskeleton interaction is not passive in general. And 
as is the case in some other amplification control paradigms, reliable stability of the human and exoskeleton likely depends on the human's achievable range of mechanical impedance behaviors and the bandwidth of the amplification controller, which for us is the virtual spring stiffness, virtual damping, and amplification ratio alpha. A major implementation caveat is that the controller requires a ground reaction force sensor that measures all three sagittal plane components of force and torque, which is hard to find. And to extend to this paradigm, we hope to investigate the choice of virtual stiffness for achieving robust stability with the human in various environments, as well as the passivity properties of the hip motion to hip constraint torque port. Our amplification approach may also be applicable to other architectures than we've considered here. Thanks for watching. I'm Gray Thomas, and I worked on this paper with Bobby Gregg at the Loco Lab at University of Michigan. I'd like to give our thanks to NSF and NIH for their generous support.